So what does a girl do when she's submitted her ancient history and Greek mythology PhD but is still waiting to do the Viva? She reads the Greek myth retellings, of course. So I don't know if you, like me, have noticed, but 2022 has had a ton of Greek myth retellings come out. It's not new, it's been happening for the past few years and it's certainly not something I'm complaining about because Greek myth retellings are actually the thing that really cemented my love of antiquity as a teenager and led in part to me doing ancient history at university and becoming an ancient historian. So I have a lot of gratitude to them for that as well as just being a great lover of them. I think they're really interesting. Greek myths are something that back in antiquity were constantly re-envisioned and retold to mean something to a contemporary audience that did change over the centuries and that's something that has continued and that I love has continued. We keep doing it and it's really fun seeing authors imagine Greek myths or analyse Greek myths or reinterpret Greek myths from a modern perspective, perhaps giving focus on voices that have been less heard in the past like women or possible queer voices or even just reimagining what those characters might have been like if they'd had the chance to express, for example, emotions that were not encouraged in antiquity. So I love it and I'm here for it, but the last thing I wanted to do over the past six to nine months was read anything to do with Greek mythology that wasn't related to my PhD. I could not have seen far enough beyond the Greek myth retellings. They were the last thing on my mind, which is such a shame because so many interesting ones were coming out, but I was focused on that thesis and nothing else antiquity related could grab me. Partially through love of my thesis and partially through hate of my thesis. Both things were going on at the same time. You may know if you've done a PhD, but it's over now and I'm excited to get back into that sort of reception of classics that I really, really miss and potentially analyse some of these books from the perspective of somebody whose expertise are the use of ancient Greek myth. My whole PhD was on the use of Greek myth in ancient Greek literature. So why not go in depth and discuss the use of ancient Greek myth in modern literature and provide that perspective from somebody who's both just a reader who loves a Greek myth retelling but is also an expert in her field. I feel very strange saying that, but I guess that's what the PhD implies. So <laughs> I do have a few that I already own, but before I show you those, I wanted to go through some of the myth retellings that have actually come out this year because there are so many of them. Just to give you an idea of the scope and the number that are being published, the ones that I've found at least include Electra by Jennifer Saint, Stone Blind by Natalie Haynes, Her Dark Wings by Melinda Salisbury, Jason by Mark Knowles, Pandora by Susan Stokes Chapman, Ithaca by Claire North, Wrath Goddess Sing by Maya Dean, Laura Olympus Volume 2 by Rachel Smythe, Arcadian Days as well as Arcadian Nights by John Sperling, Queens of Themyscira by Hannah Lynn, and The Wicked Fate by Kaylin Bayron. And we have everything there from retelling set in the modern day to retelling set in antiquity, from graphic novels to YA to adult and a little bit in between. It's a very diverse selection of genres and voices held within what feels like quite a niche subcategory of literature. But like I said, I already own a few here in my home that I thought I could start with that were actually sent to me by the publishers. So all three of the books I have here are advanced reader copies of some books that are already out. Yes, I had advanced reader copies and still haven't got to them, but like I mentioned, it was the last thing on my mind, so I'd like to potentially get to some of these during this video. The first one is Stone Blind by Natalie Haynes, which is a retelling of Medusa, but also a multiple perspective novel, so it has a few different perspectives in there. I'm not entirely sure who's included. My guesses would maybe be Perseus or Medusa's sisters, but it's not solely focused on the woman or the Gorgon Medusa herself. I have also in the past read um, Natalie Haynes' other two Greek myth retellings and very much enjoyed them, so I'm looking forward to this. Plus, and this may be a slight spoiler for the videos coming on my channel, I'm currently working on a video essay all about Medusa, so look out for that if you're interested and this will probably make a feature. Then we have Electra by Jennifer Saint. This is Jennifer Saint's second Greek myth retelling after Ariadne. The titles of these are pretty self-explanatory. This book focuses on Electra, but it's actually told both from the perspective of Electra and 
Electra's mother, Clytemnestra. And I will go into a little bit more detail about the myths themselves and the original sources and the original versions, even when there's multiple of those during this video as I read. Um, and then lastly, a little bit differently, we have Pandora by Susan Stokes Chapman. And I say differently because this one's actually set in the 1800s. So it's not set in antiquity like the other two, it's set in a more contemporary, a more recent setting. And I imagine it is slightly further removed from the original myth, but draws on the themes of the myth of Pandora, the first mortal woman in Greek mythology. So these are all on my shelves and I'd like to get to all of them, particularly, like I said, Stone Blind because of the video essay I'm working on. But I will go into depth about the myths. I will talk about my perspective as a reader as well as my perspective as an ancient historian. And I hope you'll enjoy coming along on that journey with me. So yeah, let's get into the reading. So whilst I get started on my reading, I thought this would be a good time to let you know about a resource I've been compiling for the past few years. This used to be based over on my blog, but you can now find it on my website, jeanmingus.com, and it is a classical myths retellings database. So whenever I find out about a new or an old Greek or Roman myth retelling, I pop it on this list and I give some of the information that might be key to whether you want to read it or not, including the specific myth that it retells or is in inspired by. So if you use the search function on your computer, for example, you can look up Hades and find all the ones that are perhaps retellings of Hades and Persephone. I also inform you on whether it's aimed at adults, children, young adults, whether it's a graphic novel, whether it's poetry, whether it's set in antiquity or in more modern times. And I think personally, um, quite importantly, whether it's queer or not, because I'm always looking for queer <laughs> retellings of myths. And this way, it's all there, it's all detailed. And I'm constantly updating this list. So it's currently over 150 books but there will probably be more on it in the next few weeks if you see a gap let me know I'll add it in and this will always be available to anybody interested reading update so I have been making my way through stone blind by Natalie Haynes and I thought I'd just chat to you a little bit about what I'm thinking so far what my reactions have been and now that I think of it, I've been making some notes on my phone, which is on the sofa, so let me grab it. <laughs> okay, I have my notes. <laughs> I didn't want to miss anything since I wasn't recording, you know, every time I had any thought as I was reading, because that would be like every page. Um, I wanted to do a sort of um, roundup of where I was at so far. Now, I'm not super far into it. Um, I'm about 40 odd pages into it, which isn't terribly many um but i've already had thoughts so i thought i would just like fill you in on what i've been thinking um so i think i got it on camera um i may may not have but i think i did um which was my reaction to one of the first sort of full length chapters um and that's because um this book opens or effectively opens in the first few chapters with um a sexual assault with a rape um not with a a descriptive account of the physical assault itself but very much an emotive account of the build up to it. So specifically Natalie Haynes is retelling or um, briefly retelling the myth of Metis and Zeus um, and Metis is one of Zeus's many 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 rape victims. Um, she is the goddess of uh, sort of kind of a form of wisdom and um, arbitration She's one of the titanesses and she's also um, in part the mother of Athena. She often gets overlooked as the mother of Athena who is described as being motherless because it is technically Zeus that gives birth to Athena after he swallows and consumes Metis as part of himself but she is conceived um, by Metis and Zeus um, and Metis um, is fleeing from Zeus in the myth, like it's quite a famous um, part of the myth where she's fleeing from Zeus, transforming into all of these different animals. And I just found the way that Natalie Haynes wrote that scene so emotive, um, very impactful and, you know, um, very heartbreaking and difficult to read, but really well done. Um, so 
I was impressed but you know disturbed by that and um, I thought the line at the very end of this section um, really like shone through is very impactful and which was simply the sentence as Zeus raped her she thought of being an eagle so Metis has been transforming into all of these animals trying to run away it doesn't end up working and I thought it was interesting that um, Natalie Haynes sort of included this addendum that the last animal she wishes she could have been was an eagle or she was thinking of being an eagle and um, well this happened to her because um Zeus's animal is an eagle Zeus's like official animal shall we call it is an eagle and it feels like at least to me as a reader that um like through that very simple sentence she is um hearkening back to the power imbalance between them both how um almost if Metis could be an eagle she would be free she would be the one in charge this wouldn't be happening to her and it's really painful and um emotive to read like I said but I thought well done um, and um, quite a small but um, impactful illusion if you're like aware of the myths in that aspect. And I think that already hints at some of the perspectives you're getting in this book. So yes, this book is in part a retelling of the Medusa myth, but it is not just about Medusa. It's not just from Medusa's perspective. Um, at this point, I've not actually read anything from Medusa's perspective. We've had the perspectives of Hera, Zeus's wife, we've had the perspectives of Metis, we've had the perspectives of Steno and Uriel who are the um, two Gorgon sisters of Medusa um, and we've also met a few other characters like Hephaestus and Zeus um, and Medusa but she's not been a, a main perspective at this point. Um, in terms of the scenes that have been happening among the gods um, in Olympus I did also just love this quote <laughs> <laughs> which was like peak Hera shade to me and felt very, very um, believable, um, which was the um, scene in which Hephaestus is about to smack Zeus in the head um, with an axe or a hammer um, to release Athena. Um, like I mentioned, Zeus is actually the one who gives birth to Athena through his head because he has a headache after he consumes Metis don't do that. Um, and Hera who you know has a very love-hate relationship with her husband because um, of his infidelity. Um, she's not particularly sympathetic to uh, the women he forces himself upon um, but she definitely gets angry at him about it and feels it's a personal slight. And um, what she says when Hephaestus offers to hit Zeus in the head is are you absolutely sure you want to be hit in the head with an axe? That's addressed to Zeus. Um, Hera asked I think it's a marvellous idea, she said to her son before turning back to her husband, but I'm not completely certain. I think it would make your head hurt less. Um, which I, I do love this kind of thing because what I think retellings do is they can, um, if they're well researched, draw on the characterization in the ancient versions of the myths and really give life to gods and goddesses and heroes and characters and magical creatures that we don't um, hear much from um, and it's up to every reader based on their knowledge of mythology if it reads as believable or not but for me I really felt like Natalie Haynes nailed Hera like that's exactly the reaction I would expect from Hera and I really really love the characterization of Hera because it just feels very authentic to me um, and that is the thing Natalie Haynes is a uh, fantastic writer but also a fantastic researcher like I do have a lot of faith in her retellings based on my experience of reading them in the past and my experience of hearing her talk about classics like it feels like she knows her stuff it feels like she is careful and considerate about how she retells these stories um, and what she does do is take something and fill in a lot of the gaps and strengthen a lot of the characterization and deepen a lot of the themes um, without necessarily changing much of the myth itself and I think that's quite impressive. I love the little details that she includes like the fact that the Gorgons live in Libya which is something that is referenced in sources like Persenius and Diodorus um, that Gorgons of in Libya so like I like that she has a lot of detail um, which isn't a necessity for every reader but like for me as an ancient historian it's nice um, getting that. Um, the one thing so far that I have been curious about whether she made up or there is a source for because I'm not familiar with it is that in this book it is Hera who informs Zeus about a prophecy in which um, Metis's child will overthrow 
the child's father so you know Zeus is basically in danger from any offspring that Metis has um, because of his assault on her so that is why he consumes her in the hopes of preventing this prophecy from coming true um, and the way it's portrayed in the, this book is that Hera informs him or reminds him about this myth in order to you know get revenge on Metis which is horrible obviously Hera is not <laughs> not someone who has any solidarity um with other women in mythology um she is uh, not a sympathetic character i don't find many of the gods or goddesses particularly th sympathetic but yeah she treats um the women that zeus rapes um just the same way that she treats the women he seduces and it's horrible but that's the reason that he consumes metis and i'm aware of the prophecy i'm aware of all of that but i don't think Hera's the one that tells him about it in order to punish Metis. Like, that feels like an insertion. Um, it's a very small insertion and it's part of that um, filling in the gaps and making it a cohesive narrative, which I accept from retellings and I think is absolutely fine. It fits in um, with everything else, but I would be interested if someone does know if that's like something that's briefly reference somewhere because I've never come across it myself. Um, but yeah, I think that's everything I have picked out as I've been reading so far. I'm trying to be attuned um, to anything I, I, I think is worth noting and bringing up since you're you're here to get an ancient historian's perspective. So I'm going to carry on reading and um, update you when I get a little bit further. I am enjoying it. I think it's very well done. I think it's going to be a hard book to read in lots of places because Metis's assault is not going to be the only assault in this book. There is a lot of sexual assault in Greek myth and there's a lot of sexual assault in um, the stories of the characters we've already come across. Um, but I also um, really, really just enjoy Natalie Haynes' writing and her characterisation so far. So yeah, I will check back in with you later. my new little like update spot where I'm updating you um, I actually I have an armchair here which is very comfortable and I like to read in so this is why we end up um, sitting here so often in this video um, but I have read some more of um, Stone Blind I'm 100 pages in now and I thought I would share my new notes with you on how I'm getting on and what I'm thinking and um, I chucked it away and then thought I might need it so I've grabbed it back um, okay so I think like the biggest thing so far um, since I last updated you is that I have had Medusa's perspective now we have had her included in the like milieu of characters and um, we've also had Athena added ever since she was freed from her father's head so um we also have Danae I can't remember if I mentioned Danae before but Danae is Perseus's mother so yeah we've got some more perspectives thrown in there um, and I really don't mind that it's not exclusively from exclusively from Medusa's perspective because I've read a few books exclusively from Medusa's perspective at this point including Hear the World Entire which is an adult novel by Anne Wynne Hayward and Medusa I think it's just called by Jessie Burton which is a YA novel both of which absolutely fantastic we'll link them down below highly recommend um, so I actually quite like that I'm getting lots of different characters and it's more about the um, mythology that's going on around what happens to Medusa and also kind of highlighting that it is a part of something much wider and this is the thing I would say about all Greek myth is that very rarely is a mythological story um, completely removed from the rest of mythology they are very much intertwined with one another and I think that's something that this kind of structure like demonstrates really well I'm just holding up the book it upside down at this point um so yeah we've had Medusa and I have got to the point in the story in which she is raped by Poseidon and um one of the things I thought was very interesting and kind of different from um any version of Medusa I've read before which is that Medusa is raped, it is very much a rape, um, however um, it's not a physical assault, it's like um, a coercive assault um, in that Poseidon coerces Medusa 
um, and that's how he rapes her. He effectively like blackmails her um, rather than using physical force, um, which is no less horrific. Um, it is just to point out that that is something that is really interesting to me because it feels very much like the creation of um, Natalie Haynes. I mean, it very much is a creation of Natalie Haynes. And the only um, thing I can theorise in terms of why she might have decided to do that is um, potentially to just kind of marry up the two different versions that we have about Medusa's um, encounter with Poseidon because there's only two real narratives of that, one of which is a very um, detailed description of the rape by Ovid in his Metamorphosis. Um, but we also have a reference to Medusa laying with Poseidon in Hesiod, which um, is like vaguely potentially described as um, a, a, a mournful sort of incident in her life, like not a happy thing, but it's also part of a wider narrative and that description may not specifically refer to um, the encounter between Poseidon and Medusa itself, so some have interpreted that as a consensual affair. Um, and that's something I'm going to talk about more in depth when I do my video essay all about Medusa, but nowhere is there a version um, in the ancient sources where um, he explicitly coerces her. And I thought that was really interesting. Like, I don't object to um, retailers sort of um, adapting the narrative and maybe inserting things um, that, ex I don't know, that just expand on or um, change the narrative slightly. And I'll be curious if that, like, plot point comes back up in the rest of the book. So that's been, like, my main takeaway so far. There's also a couple of other things I made a note of, including that um, when Danae ends up in the home of Dictes, um, who becomes the man that ends up raising Perseus like his own son, or in this case, um, he refers to him as a grandson, um, Dictes doesn't have a wife in this version of the story. Now, Dictes' wife is not a character that's mentioned very often in mythology. Um, Clymene, she's not, like, a big character. She doesn't play a big role, she's not mentioned often, but she is mentioned occasionally in a few different sources um, as his wife. So it's interesting that Natalie Haynes decided to do away with her. Perhaps it's because there's so little reference to her that she would effectively have had to make up an entire character about her to include her in the narrative because she's not really mentioned in the narratives themselves but she exists in the original sources so um, it was obviously a choice for Natalie Haynes not to include um, Dictee's wife. I'm not sure it's like a massive like a uh, plot point that makes much difference, but I, I did notice that and I think you wanted my perspective um, um, as somebody who's familiar with the mythology. Um, now, aside from like things that do and do not happen in the myths that Natalie Haynes changes or adapts, um, we have one of my favourite parts of the novel so far and that is the characterisation of Athena. Now, the reason I love the characterisation of Athena in this novel is because she is very much a spoilt, petulant, self-important child. Like, <laughs> she's fully grown, she's a goddess, but she um, is a very spoiled, petulant child um, uh, who gets exactly what she wants from Zeus. And um, her narration of certain events is really, really interesting. And I really like it because the thing is, um, it is a decision. <laughs> um, it is partially Natalie Haynes' insertion, but also Athena does have a history of doing quite petulant, self-important things in mythology um, where she punishes mortals um, because she thinks that they have compared themselves to her or they might threaten her and um, she does have this tendency and I kind of like that Natalie Haynes has gone with that and created this very petulant character because it's very unlike what I usually see in terms of Athena's characterization in novels. I'm not saying it's entirely right or wrong, like that's not the point of um, a novel like this, it's one interpretation of one version of her character that I can see a version of in mythology and I really like it because I don't read it often and I actually do kind of dislike Athena in general based on what she does to people in mythology. I mean I kind of dislike all the gods, I don't think any of them are particularly admirable so it's just nice to get that kind of like critical perspective on her and it's fun and I also think it plays into the wider kind of structure of this book which very much situates like what's happening to Medusa who although being a Gorgon is still mortal and Perseus and Danae who are mortals whose lives are dependent on the gods and the whims of the gods um, are so minor in the events of the gods lives. We hear about big events like the Gigantomachy which is the war between the giants and the Olympian gods and 
these things are what matter to the gods. These are the big events of their lives and otherwise they're just following their whims, whatever they may be, nice or nasty. They are not like benevolent gods and the lives of mortals are actually really meaningless to them even if they do have um, like a familial tie to one or another of them. So I really like um, that sort of element of the story. I do think it makes it slower. It does pull focus from Medusa if that's what you're looking from in this narrative. Um, but I think it really gives an indication of how inconsequential the lives of um, mortal creatures or even sometimes like minor immortal creatures are to the larger, more important gods. Um, and I think it kind of is really interesting reading like a chapter from Danae's perspective who's worried about um, her life and the life of her son and praying to Zeus and then reading a chapter from the perspective of Athena um, and getting the insight into what's actually happening in, happening in Olympus. So um, I think that's really cool. And there are a lot of characters which obviously might um, be intimidating to um, some readers if you're not as familiar um, with everybody, especially some of the more minor mythological incidents in this book like Metis or um, Amphitry. Um, but I think you could still jump into this so far, but perhaps like get yourself like a little encyclopedia or a little beginner's guide to Greek mythology. I mean, I have one. Let me insert a picture here that I wrote um, for ages like seven to 12, but I have had feedback from adults that they very much enjoyed it and learned a lot from it, um, where I obviously um, recount um, some of the more popular important myths, also some of um, the more niche myths and um, introduce a lot of the characters and gods of Greek mythology. So if you'd like that, I'll link that in the description box, but it's not the only one out there. There are plenty of books for different age ranges that might suit your purposes that you could use um, when reading books like this as like a reference. Um, I only mention mine because I've had people tell me they used it as a reference when reading like Circe, so yeah. Um, no pressure to buy it. <laughs> um, I think that kind of covers most of the stuff um, I've written down here. No, there's one more thing, one more thing I want to mention and I actually meant to mention this in the um, previous section when I was talking about Hephaestus because one thing I have made a note of when reading this book and it is not a feature just of this book, it's something that you're probably going to come across a lot when reading um, translations in particular of ancient texts and that is the use of an ableist slur when referring to Hephaestus. I won't use here, you can google it if you want, I don't think it's necessary for me to use, um, but it's a very common ableist term that is used to describe Hephaestus in the ancient material. So the tendency I think is then um, when writing books about antiquity or like based antiquity to continue the use of the um, term um, translated into English but I personally feel like it adds nothing like we can drop that term um, without using a word that is um, offensive to many and um, might be difficult for certain readers to read. I, I just don't feel it's necessary, like I don't know what it adds to the story, I think we can kind of drop the usage of that word in like common discussion um, of these characters and I get that like Natalie Haynes isn't necessarily approving of that word, it's spoken by a character who is not particularly likeable in that moment but I just don't think it's necessary um, at all particularly. Um, and these are things I have thought a lot about because of um, writing about Greek myth myself and that I have talked to friends um, who it might mean something more to um, and had their feedback on. So yeah, I don't think um, it's something we need to keep using in these kind of situations. Um, but I also wanted to flag it up in case um, you're planning on picking up this book and that would be something you would want to know in advance rather than be surprised by it. So that is what I've thought thus far in my reading experience. I, like I said, I'm about past 100 pages now so I think that's more than a third of the way through. No, it's only about a third of the way through so I've still got a chunk to read but I'll update you as I go. I also have downloaded the audiobook of Pandora by Susan Stokes Chapman um, so I'm going to start listening to that because I have a few things I need to do like tidying and um, going out on walks that I would like an audiobook for so I thought I would pick up one of the books I wanted to read in this video in that format so yeah I'll probably be updating you on that book too. I'm 
back for another update. I've actually made progress in both of my books this time. I'm not feeling great actually, I'm feeling kind of um just not great. Um but I wanted to just sit down and update you on what I'm reading. Well, I don't actually have tons to say on Stoneblind, if anything really at this point. I'm past halfway, my thoughts kind of remain the same. I'm enjoying it, it's slower paced, it's very immersive, it touches on a lot of different characters and a lot of different myths, um, but it's very detailed and very atmospheric. So yeah, enjoying this so far. But I have made some progress in Pandora by Susan Stokes Chapman, which is an interesting one because if I didn't make it clear at the beginning of this video, this isn't necessarily your traditional retelling in the sense that it takes um, a myth and follows that exact like story structure, but it is a story inspired by a myth and that is of course the myth of Pandora who was the first ever mortal woman. She was created by the gods. Um, by Zeus initially uh, with the help of the other gods um, as a punishment um, for mankind um, because mankind had received gifts from Prometheus that Zeus had never intended them to have so he decided um, to balance that out they should have women. Ancient Greece was a very patriarchal society and a lot of that is reflected in their mythology but it's a really interesting myth um, and it's probably best known for Pandora's box which is actually a bit of a misnomer because in the original text there's no box, it's a vase. Um, which I can already tell you now is something I appreciate about this book because it knows what it's talking about. In this book we have a vase. So this story is actually set in 1799 in London and we're following a young woman predominantly named Dora, short for Pandora, who um, is half Greek on her mother's side um, and her parents were both um, um, antiquarians who run, ran an antiquarian shop, they travelled the world collecting antiquities and then selling them on. But they died when she was maybe not even 10 I don't think, so since then she's been raised by her uncle who was her brother's, her brother's brother? Her father's brother um, who inherited the shop and she's now in her 20s and it's about her, it's also about a young man named Edward who we've had a few chapters from the perspective of and I'm still waiting for their stories to intertwine um, however I know that Edward is on a path to meet Pandora at this point and it has had quite a few Greek myth references so far if not following yet the storyline of the Pandora myth and I really really like that because this just feels like a good atmospheric detailed well-built historical fiction novel I'm about 70 pages in um really really like immersive in the time period and I'm enjoying that um plus I love all the references to actually just like the study of antiquity in that period the sale of antiquities the like society of antiquities and our young character Edward also is interested in becoming an antiquarian but he's not from a wealthy background so that makes it more difficult um, so I really like that aspect as well as somebody who's studied um, this stuff <laughs> um, and yeah who knows a lot about the history of the study of antiquities so I like that um, but I also like the mythological references so of course we have Pandora who is the Pandora character and Pandora in ancient Greek means all gifts and she is described in the ancient texts as being like heavily adorned with lots of like jewellery and sparkling things to be appealing and interestingly enough the Pandora in this box dreams of becoming a jewellery designer and I thought that was like a really interesting um, little tidbit and a little um, adaptation of themes and references from the original myth. I really like that. She also has a pet magpie, um, as much as you can call a magpie a pet, um, who she feeds and who brings her little bits of shiny trash basically, but that she uses to make models of her jewellery. Obviously um, there are bits of like metal and glass rather than gems and gold. Um, of course jewellery is metal but you know scrap metal not like um, gold and silver and stuff um, but she's using that to create some of her her jewellery mock-ups and this little magpie is called Hermes which I love as well because Hermes is um, the god of thieves <laughs> so I like these little references I think this is a nice novel because it reads like a historical novel for anyone who's into historical novels set in this time period but just has a lot of references to Greek mythology. Now the big plot point is obviously going to be around this vase which we've been introduced to at this point as something that her uncle has purchased. Um, it has been part of a shipment that he's ordered in and her uncle 
not the nicest person, don't really like him, um, but he's ordered this vase and he's just picked it up from the docks where the men who've had it shipped in for him are convinced it's cursed and don't want him to take it, they want to dispose of it, um, but he's greedy and insists. So I don't know where it's going to go for that, like I don't know if he's kind of in a Zeus role there, but it's it's not an exact retelling so it doesn't need to like tick all of those boxes and all of those exact characters. Um, I do think it's interesting though that Edward has an E name and this might be me reading into it a little bit much um, because in the original myth Pandora is married to Epimetheus. And I just thought, oh, E names. Maybe he's her love interest. I don't know, but I think it stands alone both just like as a historical novel thus far, um, but one that has lots of fun Greek myth references. And I'm intrigued to see where like the actual like vase plotting goes and if there's something supernatural. progress. I'm almost finished Stone Blind actually and this one I'm reading at a very fast pace via audiobook and physically because I'm just so absorbed in it so I don't think I'm going to take much longer and I wanted to just share some thoughts on where I'm at at the moment, particularly two things. So the first thing is about Stone Blind and effectively there's just a quote in here that I really liked and wanted to read to you um, which I'll explain why afterwards. So this is from the perspective of some of the nymphs in the Greek world who have just encountered Perseus and Perseus is on his way to slay a Gorgon, unnamed at this point. And the nymphs are wondering to themselves why <laughs> that's the task that Perseus has been set because um, he's doing this as he believes it will save his mother from marrying a man she doesn't want to marry. Um, and this king who set the task decided he should cut off the head of a gorgon, um, probably because it's such an impossible task um, rather than anything else. Um, but I like this observation on behalf of the nymphs. Um, this whole thing sounded so peculiar. What had the gorgons done to be embroiled in this young man's family matters? Nothing, came the reply. As far as they could tell, he did not seem to have thought about the Gorgons at all. Ordered to fetch the head of one of them, he had simply set out to do so with no thought for how the Gorgon might feel about giving it up. Obviously that is um, written in a kind of slightly silly, like fun, um, irreverent way. Um, but I just think it's a very like simple and honest observation about Greek mythology in that like, okay sure Perseus wants to save his mother but he's basically been set this task to harm somebody who he has no reason to harm other than um, he's been told to yet he is remembered as a hero. Um, and I just think like Natalie Haynes really squeezes in kind of the um, contradictions and ironies and um, oh, I don't know, um, inconsist not inconsistencies, but yeah, contradictions and ironies in Greek mythology through some of her commentary and I enjoy that. Then in terms of Pandora, the one thing I wanted to say, because I'm much more cautious about spoiling this book, with Stone Blind it is simply the myths from beginning to end written in Natalie Haynes's beautiful writing and um, sort of atmospheric style so I really don't think in a video like this I can avoid spoiling it if you don't know the myths um, and I'm pretty sure I flagged up that there might be spoilers at the beginning of this video. However with Pandora it is much more of like a new story just inspired by the myths so like I said I want to be conscious not to spoil too much of it so you can still enjoy it if you haven't read it yet um, but one thing I did think was interesting is that the vase I mentioned earlier is actually inscribed with 
um, the mythical narratives around Pandora and Prometheus and Zeus and the, the mortals and the fire, um, etc. Which shows that these myths are recognised in the w world or universe of this book. Like those myths have happened, the ancient Greek myths are acknowledged, the characters of the ancient Greek myths are acknowledged, including Pandora herself. So. I always think that's interesting. It reminds me a little bit of Jane Steele, which is a reimagining somewhat of Jane Eyre, but in a universe which Jane Eyre exists, that book exists, and the protagonist is reading that book, yet her life also sort of mirrors elements of that book. But those were my observations so far on both of these books, and I might actually have finished one, if not both of them, when I next update you. So yeah, stay tuned for that. stone blind and I thought I would just share how I was feeling at the end of both books. So first of all I guess stone blind since we started there. Um, this book is really beautifully written which is something I would say for both of these books really really beautifully written. I, I love the level of detail in this. I loved the like diverse selection of gods and nymphs and characters and heroes that we got in here because for me it really was indicative of how intertwined Greek mythology is and how like one small event leads to another small event and how this terrible thing that maybe happens to one character is actually a build up of lots of other things going on in the mythological world that they're not even aware of and I think Natalie Hangley captures that in this book. I will say I think this book will be difficult to read if you know no mythology. Like I'm not sure this is really a book you can jump into with absolutely no mythological background whatsoever. I don't think you need to know all the details and in-depth different versions of these myths to enjoy this book but if you don't like have a basic understanding of say like the structure of um the sort of Greek gods on Olympus um and maybe like what some of the different mythical creatures are in Greek mythology I think this will be harder to read I definitely think you could maybe read it with an accompanying sort of guide to Greek myth like I mentioned before but I will say it's not necessarily the book to start with Greek myth retellings if you've never read one before and know nothing about myth. I kind of doubt that you've made it to the end of this video. As somebody who's never read anything about Greek myth before because I feel like this video is going to appeal most to people who enjoy Greek myth but if you have then just to say that I think this one is for people who are already kind of fans of Greek myth. You don't have to know tons but that you have a basic understanding and if you do then it's really beautiful, it's really in-depth and what surprised me the most about it when I got to the end is that it goes beyond Medusa's life in the sense that in the myth she's slain by Perseus. Again, I kind of not really sort of counting actual myths as spoilers but she's slain by Perseus um, and then Athena um, takes her head and it becomes part of her shield and that is incorporated and you hear from Medusa as the shield and the characters after the death of Medusa which is something I have never come across in myth before and I thought that was really interesting. In myth, sorry, in a retelling form. I've never come across any retelling of Medusa. So I think that's also a sort of sign of how this book is more than just Medusa. It's about all the myth around um, the characters of Medusa's myth and it's much more expansive. So um, again, if you just want like a straightforward retelling of the Medusa myth, I'd check out Here the World in Tyre for adults or Medusa by Jesse Burton for um, young adults. Um, but if you want something um, a little bit more expansive that has a lot more characters, a lot more perspectives, um, deals with a lot more of the mythological stories and how they all intertwine, then definitely check this out. We then have Pandora. Now, first off, before I actually go into my final thoughts on Pandora, I really enjoyed reading these books in tandem because I think they are so indicative of what you can do with a Greek myth. You can straightforward retell these myths set in their ancient setting whilst drawing out um, elements of different characters, 
personalities and bringing them to life and maybe exploring certain themes that are neglected elsewhere. Or you can do something which is completely different that just takes its inspiration from a myth and create almost a whole new story inspired by that myth. And these are both very different books and very different ways of dealing with Greek myth and literature but it was really nice to read them side by side because they sort of show what you can do with a myth and I really enjoyed that. So this book is very much a historical fiction book and I think you can read this with no prior knowledge of Greek mythology because you can just read it as a historical novel. You will get a lot more of the references if you're familiar with the myth of Pandora but it's still an enjoyable book without that I think. I just think that's like an extra bonus for antiquity fans. Um, some of the further myth references I noticed as I was reading it beyond the whole like pithos jar um, element and actually I do really like that. I really like that she specifically made the jar in this book a pithos because pithos is the type of jar that it is in the ancient myths generally so I really like that. Um, and pithos can actually refer to the womb not just the um, physical jar so it's one of those like possible multi-meaning myths where the jar could be the womb in the myth but anyway that's that's going away from what this book is about. So I like that she made it a pithos, um, but it also has um, a character called Helen. She's not a character per se, she's the mother of our protagonist, she's already dead, but I liked that when I realised that there was a Helen. I also realised um, as I was reading that um, Edward's friend Cornelius almost feels like a Prometheus role in certain ways because he grew up with Edward so they have like a brotherly relationship although in instances it felt like they could have had a romantic one but um, that wasn't really a plot point that was um, explored. It just felt like it could have happened, it could have happened, um, but it didn't, um, so don't expect like um, a queer story here. Um, so Cornelius fulfills that Prometheus role almost in the fact that they have this almost brotherly relationship, they're very close friends, they grew up together and Prometheus is Epimetheus' brother in the myth and Prometheus is the one that warns Epimetheus not to trust any gifts from Zeus and Cornelius is never quite trusting of Pandora in this so he sort of has that voice of should you really be doing this, should you be taking these leaps of faith, should you be trusting these people. Whether he's right or wrong I, I will not say, I don't want to spoil how this book goes because it isn't a direct retelling um, but I like that, I felt like there was lots of inspiration clearly drawn from the original myths if a whole new story was being created nonetheless. So yeah I thought these were both very good, I think um, if you like historical fiction like Jesse Burton's historical fiction or The Mermaid and Mrs Hancock, um, these kind of novels then you will enjoy this regardless of whether you're into the ancient stuff or not um, and if you are looking for something a bit more in depth in terms of a retelling then you'll enjoy Stone Blind. So yeah those are my thoughts as both a reader and an ancient historian. I hope they have been helpful, I hope they have been interesting, let me know. There's obviously so many myth retellings out there and constantly coming out so let me know if you'd like more videos like this in the future. I could read some older books like Percy Jackson or I could read some more new releases. Um, do let me know in the comments down below and if you've read either of these books let me know what your thoughts were but until next time happy reading and I'll see you again soon. Bye everyone!